one. All right, folks, we are back in business here with the co-founders of Goldfinch Health. Along with us today, we have Bran Newland and John Greenwood. Greenwood, uh, gentlemen, thanks for being with us today. Glad to be here. Thanks, Kevin. We're happy to have you. And you know, uh, Goldfinch Health, you know, a company who's is helping people, uh, you know, have a successful pathway back from their surgeries to whatever they're doing, whether it's work, their life, just in general. Uh, it, it's interesting to think about. And for me myself, who just this morning just absolutely kicked my ass doing some cycling, um, I myself have to get some surgery. So the first question I have for you, John, is is if if I do get surgery, what would that look like for myself, and how does your company work with my employer? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question, and I uh, I hope we can help you through your surgery. But the typical pathway people are encountering now is they may have a referring physician say, I I use this surgeon, so why don't you go see him for you know your particular ailment? Say it's a hernia, and that surgeon will will confirm the diagnosis and book you for surgery. They'll have a meeting or two, and you may actually even meet that, meet that surgeon the day of, and they're certainly gonna tell you, don't have anything to drink after midnight the day before your procedure, or the night before your surgery. You're gonna get to the hospital, they're going to wheel you back, they're going to do the procedure, as odds are kind of a traditional approach. And then when they wake you up, they will give you, um, depending on the invasiveness of the procedure, they're gonna give you pain medications. And a lot of times that's something like a Tylenol. And very, very often it is an opioid as well. They will try to send you home uh, as soon as it's reasonable and follow up. uh, Oftentimes with a a nurse will try to call you the next day or two, but that gets gets lost a great deal of time. And they'll they'll have a follow up uh, a week or two later with the physician. And then they'll say, we'll see you in another month. And ultimately at that point, they'll let you go back to work. So it's really kind of a, um, uh, a bit of a hodgepodge of the system. And it's really the best we've had. What Goldfinch is trying to do and has begun doing is really turn some of those presumptions on its head. Um, for instance, we believe that communication with the patient uh, is vital and is critical. When you're in the the uh, meeting with your physician to begin with, you may not know the questions you need to ask, or you may not want to be a pain, so you just kind of glaze over it. Or you may have heard the word cancer and you just shut down. So you've got limited time with your with your physician. And in the physician's defense, they have to see a lot of patients that day as well. So we think that there's a, a critical component in there that could be interceded. And one of the most uh, important points that our nurse has is a, is a fully uh, worked out app, secure messaging that helps you communicate uh, securely and answer some of those simple questions or questions that aren't simple that should be or that uh, should raise a little bit more of a concern uh, that our app, our app helps you out with. But, but ultimately and perhaps most importantly, what we're helping the patients to do is understand their options. And rather than re- necessarily a, a referral pattern from a clinician, a primary care physician, who doesn't really know who the best operator is or who is operating the best minimally invasive fashion, Goldfinch does. We have a nationwide network of physicians that help you to have an option for your most minimally invasive procedure. And ultimately, and I'll, I'll take a breath here, we um, let Brand explain this a little bit more, but we advocate for the clinical terms of that procedure with what we call an enhanced recovery protocols uh, or um, and this is really kind of a, uh, uh, a new way of putting the patient at the center of every surgical decision, which you'd be shocked to learn is not necessarily what's going on now. So, Brand, do you want to explain a little bit what these protocols look like? Yeah, I'd love to. So, you know, as John was mentioning, there's three uh, sort of three aspects to what Goldfinch Health does. One is uh, nurse navigation through the entire surgical pathway. So patients uh, making a decision around surgery rather than the status quo of relying totally on a referral from primary care doctor, this is a way of adding uh, sort of a layer of intelligence or a trusted care guide to that process, considering your options around surgery and, uh, and then tracking with you each step along the way, helping you prepare for surgery and then the days and the weeks uh, that may come after surgery and your recovery, uh, somebody there to, uh, to answer questions that come up and, 
and, uh, and help you get back to your life and get back to work. So nurse navigation is, is one piece of what we do. The app supporting the nurse and supporting the patient in that uh, preparation for surgery and in the follow-up after surgery, that's the second thing we do. But truly the foundation of our approach in helping, uh, helping people and their employers for that matter experience surgery and recovery in a new way is what's called enhanced recovery after surgery. At least that's what it's called in the medical field. We often refer to it as advanced surgical pathways. And the reason we do that is because uh, enhanced recovery after surgery makes it sound like everything happens after surgery. And actually uh, what, uh, what uh, truly matters is the preparation for surgery. So I'll just make a couple comments on what that means and then be happy to, to answer more questions about it, Kevin, if you'd like. But enhanced recovery after surgery uh, came out of Europe about 15 years ago where a, a group of doctors started testing these long-held assumptions, the dogma of surgery. It was things like, should you really be fasting for 12 hours before you go into surgery? Are you really setting the patient up for success to go into the trauma of surgery on an empty tank? And perhaps not surprisingly, the answer to that is no. Uh, you're not setting the patient up for success to go in with an empty tank. In fact, uh, you'd be much better off if you were drinking a, a carbohydrate beverage two or four hours before surgery to clear out your GI system, your GI tract, and, and spike your blood sugar so you're not uh, cratering during surgery. So that's just one example. There's other examples of the pieces of these enhanced recovery care pathways. One of them, one of the most important, is called uh, multimodal analgesia. The old way of doing surgery is you create the pain and you sort of treat the pain after you create it which kind of makes sense. But if you think about it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So what if you could, what if you could treat the pain before you create it? What if you could get into the pain pathways in the body, several of the pain pathways uh, with different types of pain medications before you make the first cut, so to speak, in the surgery? And that's exactly what multimodal analgesia is. You go into the surgery with treating the pain before you start, and it turns out that dramatically reduces the need for pain medication, especially opioids, after the fact. So these doctors in, in Europe, they started piecing together 10 or 15 of these types of interventions around surgery. Again, like John said, putting the patient at the center uh, of each of the decisions. And what they found was that uh, that, that approach led to 30% shorter hospital stays, 50% fewer complications, up to 90% uh, less need for opioids, and ultimately faster return to life, faster return to work. Yeah, I mean, this is important, right? Uh, you know, there's 50 million surgeries a year. Uh, you know, if I, like, again, if I'm cycling on a Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. and, you know, I break my back because God knows how long it's been since I've been on a bike, mm -hmm. um, you know, I actually wouldn't know what to do. The only time I've had surgery, gentlemen, I think was uh, when I had my wisdom teeth pulled. I went into a room. I didn't really know the doctor. He put me on laughing gas or whatever it was. And I woke up completely delusional and got handed, you know, a prescription for a whole bottle of yep. uh, oxycodone. Um, fortunately, my parents and I've had a family member who had gone through that route before. We didn't want to do it again. I didn't take any, didn't really need it. Um, nor I think I didn't really need it after three days, uh, to be honest. Um, so, uh, John, you know, have you experienced any surgery and, in, in uh, you know, with such a simple solution in terms of educating and ha having nurses and, and like, uh, uh, brand said, getting ahead of the pain pathways, where does this idea come from and have, and did you have an experience that, um, uh, was the root of this solution? Well, it, it, uh, no, that's a great question. And it. It was a little bit of a culmination of um, a lot of experiences in my um, my career of being in the operating room with with uh, as a as a vendor of a, a minimally invasive um, robotics and minimally invasive equipment, and I was really able to see the contrast between optimal care, which was po what was possible in those dramatic results, and what was far more common. There's one day that was particularly poignant that I think I had just about enough of seeing it that. Uh, that I realized that this was, I was passionate enough about it that I needed to quit my job and, and uh, try to do something about it, uh, obviously with Brand's help. And I had, I had worked, we had spent a great deal of time helping a physician um, learn how to do what's called a uh, intracorporeal anastomosis on a sigmoid colon resection. And basically what oh, that what? means is- that <laughs> What was that? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain it, don't worry. It uh, took me years to be able to say that. Uh, stumbling over it, but effectively what it is is this patient had a deep cancer in their colon and 
traditionally, you cut them from the pubic bone to the sternum. You get what's called the uh, book walter, and you, you pull them apart, and you get in there because it's so hard to reach. Well, with some modern equipment, um, including the Da Vinci robot, you're actually able to do this in a minimally invasive fashion with these tiny little eight millimeter incisions and almost like get your head in there and, and operate in a really, really effective manner. This surgeon had gone, had great hands and had done a ton of extra training. And so he was able, the intracorporeal portion of this procedure means that he was all of the plumbing inside and therefore just extract the specimen out of a little little incision, a fan, ex, a fan of steel extraction, uh, just kind of lateral and off the side and suture that back up. He, uh, this patient had also gotten an enhanced recovery protocol. And the, patient, or the physician called me the next day and he said, John, I can't believe it. That case yesterday, the patient wants to go home today. And I've never let anyone go home less than five days after surgery and she's already passed some gas and that's usually my indicator. So I'm just gonna basically keep her another day for my own my own security and sure enough you let her go home post-op day two those patients are and and without any opioids so opioids have a bowel suppression uh as well as a for a side effect so that was another reason she was up and mobile she felt good and her her guts were working again so it, those are the days where you you come home you kiss your wife you hug your kids it's just a great day but i was up there the day that he let her go home and i was with another physician who had not gone through this additional training. And sure enough, he was doing the same procedure, but this time in that open and far more common approach. So that patient, instead of 90 minute procedure, it took four and a half hours. The patient's lit so hot under the lights that he's literally sweating into the patient as they're trying to, to dab his forehead. And as we were wheeling the patient out, I had mentioned to the nurse, I said, this is kind of a tragedy because, because this is the kind of patient who's going to be in the hospital for eight days on average. They've got a 20% chance of having a hernia developed to pre for the incision we just created. And they have an 18% chance of getting an opioid, becoming an opioid, uh, persistent opioid user. Mm -hmm. And she turned to me, she goes, I know we were just talking about that. The tragedy is that they both have the same employers. So, you know, they had the same insurance. One just got lucky and the other did not. And, it just to this day strikes me cold realizing this is the best we've got for people. Mm -hmm. I know right. more about the restaurant I'm eating at or the tires I just bought than who's going to be operating on my loved one to cut out that cancer. And so that's when I called Brand and was lamenting. And he basically said, are you tired of complaining about it? Let's do something about this. So that was a little bit of our inspiration um, uh, to start Goldfinch and try to do something to, to improve healthcare. Yeah, it's it's interesting how entrepreneurs kind of uh, arrive upon their their destiny, their purpose, or whatever that may be. Um, Brand, what's what's your background and kind of what led to your discovery of uh, Goldfinch Health? Yeah, so I went to uh, I went to pharmacy at the University of I Pharmacy School at the University of Iowa. That's actually where John and I met, and uh, I joined a startup, a pharmacy related startup, uh, coming out of pharmacy school, sort of a non traditional path coming out with a doctorate of pharmacy degree. Most folks go into either community practice of pharmacy or they go into hospital practice of pharmacy. But, uh, but I knew that wasn't for me. I knew I, I wanted to do something a little off the beaten path and entrepreneurial. So I joined a, um, a company called Outcomes MTM out of, uh, out of pharmacy school as a fourth employee. And that, uh, that company was doing something that's going to sound familiar because it's uh, in, in some ways similar to uh, the story with Goldfinch. Uh, there were a certain set of pharmacists. This is back in the early 2000s uh, that were practicing in an innovative way. It was helpful to patients, avoiding medication complications, but, uh, but nobody knew how to find them. And they, there really wasn't a spotlight being shined on those innovative practitioners. Uh, and they, there really weren't incentives in place uh, for those practitioners to grow their practice uh, and for patients to, to find that experience until these incentives were aligned. Um, so that's what that company worked on. Uh, in the area of medication therapy management. So I was with that company for 15 years. Um, that company was eventually sold to Cardinal Health. Um, uh, had a great growth story. And uh, after that had taken place around 2015 or so, uh, I decided it was time to do something else entrepreneurial. And uh, that was about the time that we had the conversation John was talking about. Um, I also happened to have a personal experience around surgery around that same time where my mom had a 
a cancer related surgery. And while I was just starting to learn about enhanced recovery after surgery care pathways, I got to see it in action. Um, she went to MD Anderson for that surgery. And in the, uh, in the surgery recovery area, it literally looks like um, the walking area at your local gym. Right? Every, you could sit in, in her uh, room as she was recovering and watch as patients walk by all day, uh, because that's another aspect to these enhanced recovery protocols is getting patients up and moving and back to some semblance of activity, activity as soon as possible. Uh, that gets the blood flowing and it just helps the overall healing process. And it could not have been more obvious that uh, that was an important part of the care uh, pathways, the care protocols at, at that hospital. And you know, there was even a scoreboard on her wall that was showing how often she had walked each day and a number of other measures that I've since come to learn are key aspects of enhanced recovery after surgery. So fast forward to her discharge, three days post-op, she left the hospital looking just as good as she did the day before she went in for that pretty major abdominal surgery. And she left without a single prescription for an opioid. Now compare that to the status quo. Uh, despite everything we know about opioids and all of the downstream effects and the risk of persistent opioid use and addiction, it's still the case that the average surgical patient leaves the hospital with a, a prescription for 82 dosages of an opioid. That's the average today in the United States. My mom left after three days without a single dose. And that's all I needed to see. She was back uh, on her feet and uh, on the path uh, to full recovery very quickly after surgery. And I knew at that point, that's the exact experience that I would want for myself. If I ever needed surgery, it's the experience I would want for any other loved one or friend who is going for surgery. And it's the kind of experience that should be standard of care. And that's why um, I knew that John and I had to do this. Uh, we had to do the irrational thing, quit our perfectly good jobs and, uh, and forego anything else we might be doing and go after this because this is an innovation that deserves its time in the spotlight. Well, Brent and John, it seems like you both had a you know, similar you know, revelation and they both align. And, and the revelation is it's, it's simple and easy of what people can be doing to you know, uh, have some success uh, for their health and, and careers uh, post-surgery. Um, and so I guess the, the simple question for an easy answer is, is w- what is taking so long and what challenges have you both ran into uh, along the way in, ter- in terms of getting this off the ground? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it's one we kind of wrestle with a little bit ourselves. You know, it sounds like such a great idea. It's so simple, the ROI is so strong. Uh, why isn't everyone doing this? And, and the reality is that it's, it's, there's not one simple answer to a, a simple question. We are, um, we are encountering a lot of, I wouldn't say misaligned incentives, but a lot of times incentives end. You know, for instance, why doesn't a hospital uh, adopt these protocols ubiquitously? And the reality is they're starting to uh, crop their head up, but in longer um, in, in a more invasive or more intensive procedures. So for instance, a, uh, a, for a particular procedure with a uh, new Accountable Care Act, for the most part, patients are getting a bundled payments or are giving a bundled payment to the hospital. So meaning a colon procedure, as we were talking about, is a $20,000 give or take procedure. So the hospital gets $20,000, whether that patient's in there for three days or for eight. So they are very have very strong incentive to get them out of the hospital and there for effectively off of their, um, um, you know, off of their uh, dole. Uh, but on a, say, an outpatient procedure like a hysterectomy or a hernia, where these patients are out the same day or maybe the next day, the, the hospital doesn't really care because your odds are you're not coming back anyway. But our argument is that doesn't mean you're done healing. And that doesn't mean giving them a bunch of opioids so you don't get the call in the middle of the night is actually good health care. Uh, so that you as a physician don't get the call uh, in the middle of the night. So, and really, ultimately what this comes down to is change is hard. And we, I was doing a little bit of um, uh, research a few years ago on, on, uh, on wh- what makes things progress and what makes things go faster. And I found, I thought, a really applicable anecdote and that was a, uh, Dr. Zummelweis, who was a um, obstetrician in Austria in the mid 19th century. And what he was tasked with was trying to find out 
why the women at the hospital who delivered with midwives were more likely to survive their child, the childbirth than those who were delivered with a physician. And what he found is he wasn't quite sure why, but that maybe it would have been a good idea for the physicians to wash their hands between doing autopsies on the women who had passed and going and delivering that next child. And he said, sure enough, they, they washed their hands with a little bit of chlorine, a little bit of lye, and the, uh, the um, survival rates improved dramatically, so much so that the physicians then were more likely to help the women than the midwives. But it took them 30 years for this to become universally adopted. There's a lot of in line, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, we as humans have a hard time adopting despite the strongest evidence to the contrary. And so we're 15 years into these enhanced recovery protocols and it's still not universally adopted. And this is still the first time that a lot of people, including physicians are hearing about this. And we refuse to stand beside and wait for another 15 years before this is adopted. We wanna accelerate that because we know it can help patients it can help cost with our healthcare system immensely, and it can really help turn off the faucet of the number one way to enter into an opioid addiction, and that is through surgery. And John, I, I, I you know, hear the why, obviously. Uh, you know, there's the, the, the telltale all of, uh, you know, it's so simple, but to, you know, change is difficult. It's taken 30 years to do. Um, this is to take a long time. Uh, to grow and to become sustainable and successful. Brand, uh, what's the vision uh, for uh, Goldfinch Health uh, in the next, say, five years? And what do you want to do? Well, first things first, we're going to uh, combine the three things that we're talking about in a unique way, the nurse navigation, the patient engagement app, um, and obviously the enhanced recovery after surgery care pathways into a into a, um, into a solution that truly revolutionizes the patient experience uh, in surgery and does so across surgery types. Um, there's evidence out there that uh, supports the effectiveness of various aspects of what we're talking about, but never, never truly altogether and at scale. Um, so the first thing is to, to unleash the true potential of combining these three um, individual solutions into one um, integrated solution and and see what we can achieve. Um, but from there, um, as we as we go, you know, we're initially going to market uh, to employers and uh, talking with them about not only the potential for savings in healthcare costs if they're self-insured, meaning you know most major employers over 500 or, or so employee uh, employees, they're actually paying the bills uh, for the uh, healthcare costs. They may have a uh, a major health insurer that is the claims processor, but um, at the end of the day, they're paying the bill. So they care about utilization of healthcare resources and, and preventative measures and avoiding complications and, and the like and opioid addiction. Um, they care about those things. They also happen to care about employee productivity and employee engagement and employee morale, uh, the kinds of things that uh, we can go after by helping people get back to work sooner, happier and healthier um, and more consistently. Um, so that's why we're going after the uh, self-insured employers first. But we, as we grow and expand and getting to your question, Kevin, about where I see this going, one thing I see is we ex we'll, we'll expand our market to, um, to consumers directly. Uh, we'll expand to insurance, healthcare insurance uh, providers who may wish to provide this uh, for their own incentives, for their own reasons. Um, I also see that uh, we could expand in a way where um, we become sort of a, a platform for the entire surgical experience and even alternatives to surgery. You know, right now we're, you know, the old saying goes, how do you, uh, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one, one bite at a time. Well, we're trying to take our first bite of the elephant here and, and improving and, and truly transforming the surgical experience. But we all know uh, that there are times when you think surgery might be the, the best option and there could be alternatives uh, where you never had to have a surgery in the first place. And there's not truly a, a platform for considering those alternatives, be it physical therapy or acupuncture or other interventions. Um, but there could be, there should be. And uh, I, I, could see, uh, I could see us evolving in that way over time also into a, to a full platform for the consideration of how do you best prepare for surgery if you need it and get your way through it, 
or even think about alternatives to, uh, to that experience. And Brent, just to go off your point, um, you know, because I know so much about the healthcare industry, you know, I was doing some research um, and I, I think I found that um, it wasn't until post World War II was the first time when companies started offering health insurance for their employees, which would create a lot of different incentives and really boosted the, the healthcare um, uh, industry itself. Uh, it's, it's, but I still don't know the difference between a payer and a provider. So John, uh, for healthcare specifically, can you describe to our audience um, and myself the difference between a payer and a provider? Sure. You're, it, it, um, your provider ultimately is that physician who is, who is uh, treating you and, and um, uh, helping guide you through your, your process and, and, and back to return normal health they oftentimes go through go through their the, the um, rigorous education with an idealistic uh, mentality of we're going to get out there and i'm going to help save patients and i'm going to treat everyone and it's i'm really going to practice medicine i'm going to change the world oftentimes they run up against the financial forces that are not aligned again with them and um at times those are and, and ultimately on the other end of it is the payers who are trying to do the best they can to minimize costs, to uh, reduce um, uh, reduce redundancies, or uh, even question: Is this is this a um, an absolutely necessary test to run? Because there's a one in a million chance that that we could find something, but the reality is it's a hundred percent chance it's going to cost us a thousand dollars. So when you look at these two kind of forces that um, are constantly kind trying to swim together and hold hands as, as they walk down this path, the patient finds themselves in the middle trying to understand which, um, you know, which incentives align with them. Right. So when, when we look at this, there's, there's not really, a, we like to demonize particular people within a healthcare system. And the reality is we're all rational actors. Everyone in the healthcare system is behaving rationally. That's one of the ways, reasons we're trying to go after the, with the payers is to drive demand on the patient's behalf to, to ultimately, uh, we, we realize in this country uh, that so much good has come when there is transparency, when there are options and there is a true understanding of their availability. That's the reason we have Samsung phones and iPhones. We don't just have one because ultimately they make everything better when we have competition and transparency for the consumer which we don't really find exists right now in, uh, in healthcare. Uh, and that was a really good point. I think you hit on John is uh, we're all acting rationally. Uh, Cause I was about to throw some questions, lots of questions in about, well, whose fault is it? You know, is <laughs> those uh, opioid prescriptions, is it the doctor? Is it the, the pharmaceutical companies? You know, what is it? But um, I, I really like what you're saying in terms of transparency um, for that being a solution. Um, what, what do you fear the most? Like, is there something that, like whether it's a, uh, a policy change or a change in the pharmaceutical industry, a change in the healthcare industry, is there something that you fear the most that might inhibit, um, you know, Goldfinch from, from being a, a source or a solution for, um, you know, a whole approach to, to recovery? I'll take the first crack at this. I'd love to hear what John has to say about this also. <laughs> it's, like, it's like group therapy for co-founders. <laughs> 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 You know, I, honestly, one of the things I fear is that uh, I'm confident that this is needed. We, we haven't talked to a single person in a year plus since we uh, hatched the idea around Goldfinch and then formally founded Goldfinch in 2018. We haven't talked to one person who, at the conclusion of our description of what we're working on, has said, yeah, but I'm pretty confident we've got surgery figured out. I know exactly what I would do if I needed surgery tomorrow. N nobody thinks that. And in particular, if if we happen to talk to someone who has a, surger, a surgical experience, almost to a person, they tell us how it didn't go as well as they hoped. <laughs> uh, I don't think we've talked to, at best they say it was fine. You know, I kind of gritted my teeth and, and got my way through it, but nobody is, is you know, nobody's really experiencing an, an ideal uh, version of surgery that we think is it's possible. It's out there. The science exists today. The technology exists today and the knowledge base is out there today to support a better experience. So really what I fear is that for some reason or another, uh, we're not able to get the message across <laughs> that uh, we don't have the right, um, 
we don't put together the right business model. We don't put together the right, um, you know, payment model or structure to get this information in front of the most patients uh, possible because I, I'm confident that this is a better way. Like I said before, it's the way that I know personally I would want, if for anybody who's listening um, to the podcast, if they don't get anything else out of this, ask for enhanced recovery if surgery comes into your life for yourself or for somebody else. Ask about minimally invasive approaches to surgery and especially enhanced recovery protocols. You know, your surgeon will probably fall out of his or her seat that you're that informed huh. as a patient and, uh, and you'll just, you'll have a better experience. Um, but ultimately my fear is that uh, for some reason we can't, we can't scale this as a business to kind of catalyze this better approach. But uh, John, what do you think? Thanks, Brad. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think that's the fear of any, any startup, um, you know, and, and I would just add maybe on a more personal uh, level, I've, I have um, loved ones battling addiction right now. I have um, have loved ones who have lost family members. Uh, we've had friends that have ended up in prison. This is the opioid portion is is so um, is so personal that I fear that if we can't deliver on this, that it won't be solved. Um, maybe someone more talented or more passionate can come along, but in a year, we have um, a year and change. We've really been encountering some great companies working to combat the opioid epidemic, but almost no one is working on the preventative measures. Certainly, there is not a better option that I've found that is, is clinically sound at preventing opioid addiction. It's just the, the underlying pain in the first place. So I fear that if we cannot deliver on this, um, that we'll have let a lot of people down, and most importantly ourselves. So uh, when you're going to market, are you going directly to companies that have a lot of employees that can then get on the app and then possess the advanced surgical pathways? Is that kind of the route you're taking or what's really going to drive that, that growth? Yeah, the, the, uh, the go to market strategy for us is to go to the employers. By and large, okay. those employers that have 250 or more employees uh, sure. for a couple of reasons. One is those, as mentioned before, those are the, size of companies that are self-insured. So they have even more incentives to care about something like a better experience in surgery and recovery. Hmm. Uh, they're paying the bills for the healthcare costs and they also care about employee engagement and employee absences, uh, employee uh, productivity. Um, so that, that's, where we're, um, that's where we're starting. The other reason that we go after somewhat larger um, employers is just the incidence of surgery. You know, thankfully surgery is not something that happens every day or every week or every year for a, for, a given, uh, for a given person. But when it does happen, it's the most important thing happening in your life. Um, so we're trying to position the employers as um, being there for their employees uh, at a time of pretty great need and fear, um, honestly. And this is taking place at a time when there's some other major trends, not the least of which is the opioid epidemic, the opioid crisis, but there's also this trend going on in healthcare that, um, that you may be aware of where employees or members are be given, they're, they're being given more skin in the game around uh, health insurance, so to speak, greater out-of-pocket responsibilities for their healthcare costs, and that's scary. Um, so the most progressive employers are trying to surround their employees. Well, they, while they may be shifting more towards um, health savings accounts and high deductible plans, then giving the employees more skin in the game uh, as a consumer of healthcare services, the most progressive employers are surrounding their employees with tools and resources and um, services and solutions like ours to help, uh, help them through some, some times of need. Uh, is there a company out there, John, that uh, you respect the most in terms of kind of how uh, their employment health care plans or benefit programs, I guess, are set up and a company that you would find that you would want to work out, work with? That's a, um, no, that's a really good question. And this has been what's been fascinating kind of in our go-to-market strategy is really meeting those innovators and, and who might be um, willing to, um, to, to work with the startup. Uh, you know, one company we've had a, a great deal of um, conversation with is a publishing company who has, who ultimately takes great pride in being one of the first to, to work on programs because they acknowledge that the way things are done is, 
is leading to a lot of these problems. It's not the solution. It's oftentimes the problem. So we're in, um, uh, um, you know, final conversations with them to, to uh, help with their employee population. And what's been very interesting is we're working with um, this company and a few others was they provide us some other data for us to review is that they're, that surgery is so uh, challenging at times and such an esoteric knowledge base with it because of its rarity that we don't even know we have a problem. Uh, as Brand was mentioning, some people say, well, that was my experience. Well, the reality is you oftentimes, there are some procedures that um, say, take for instance, a bariatric procedure uh, has a 4% open rate, meaning 96% of the time, Physicians can do this very complicated procedure, talk about rearranging your guts uh, for a weight loss procedure. They can do that minimally and basically without cutting you open. But then on the other hand, you have an inguinal hernia procedure, which is still a done open at the time. And 12% of those patients have a um, have chronic pain. So there, you know, as I don't want to necessarily name specific companies just for their own sake, they may not... Uh, 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 they not, may not be um, ready for that yet. There are certain companies out there that are ready and willing and understand this process enough to say, we know enough that we should hand this over to the experts. And these three things are common sense, but they're with, with an improved physician, with a nurse to help guide you through it, and these protocols. But yeah, that sounds like a better deal. And we're going we're gonna to run with this because we care about our patient or employees. And when they hear surgery, that's a time we can not just step back and say, do what you need to, but we can actually be there and help guide you through the process and usher you to a better re result. I think you both have a good point in terms of uh, uh, surgery being unexpected too. And it just takes, like John, or, uh, Brand said, just takes over your life. Um, the only time, and I'll share a little personal story, it's kind of funny. Uh, I ha almost had to get surgery was... You know, this time I wasn't on a bike. I was doing something, you know, I was in college, doing what college kids do best. And next day, <laughs> next day, you know, my shoulder is just bust. It's like my, my arms, you know, hanging off. And as a college student, um, you know, with strict parents, I did not want to tell them. I did not want to go get surgery. I did not um, want to admit, you know, to what had happened. Um, and I actually started an internship <laughs> literally in the next week and I had to go into that internship and just, you know, force myself not to wear a sling, carry boxes without, you know, I had a, I had a torn AC. I mean, I couldn't really do any of that, but just toughed it out. Um, you know, a lot of people can't afford surgery. Uh, a lot of people can't, um, uh, or at least think they can't afford surgery and it's very difficult for them. You know, does this app, uh, discriminate against any socioeconomic, uh, levels in America? This is for uh, uh, for brand. Yeah, and you know, I would just add, Kevin. A lot of people can't afford to be out of work longer I, than they need to be. Totally, totally. Um, yeah. So you know, while they may have, they may have health insurance that's at least helping with the cost of surgery. They're concerned about leaving it all to get that, um, you know, to get the hernia repaired, to get uh, to get the the hysterectomy or whatever that surgery may maybe that they need because they, they can't afford to be on uh, limited wages on a short-term disability plan for, for weeks on end. Um, and that's really who we're trying to help. You know, something we did here uh, a couple months ago, we did, uh, we did some consumer research uh, in the form of a survey where we asked, we asked uh, several hundred people about how they would make surgery decisions. And um, we had some interesting findings there, but what, one of the interesting things we found was uh, with, with folks who are relatively inexperienced with surgery, who tended to be lower income and younger, uh, which makes sense. So kind of uh, uh, early working years and uh, under $100,000 annual household income. Some of the things that those folks said were important to them, one of the most important factors to them was getting back to work um, for the exact reason I think that, um, that, uh, that I just mentioned. The other interesting finding was they said that uh, if, if faced with surgery today, the, the way they would make that decision is based on referrals and based on geography, um, which kind of proves the point of what uh, we're, we're trying to get across is that that's the historical pattern. You listen to 
at a time when you're scared and you're hearing about a diagnosis that's maybe it's a maybe it's an injury that needs repaired, maybe it's cancer, uh, maybe it's a joint replacement. Who knows what it is? But it's a serious health issue that's requiring surgery, and you're listening to a to a referring physician. You're probably just going to take that advice, and next thing you know, you're you're getting signed up for surgery. Um, our point is, it might behoove you to think about a second opinion, uh, think about other considerations, and maybe there is a another option that could get you through that surgery uh, better and, and back on your feet and back to your life sooner. And, and you know, for that matter, when we asked the the older uh, the older group uh, who's more experienced with surgery in that same survey. They gave us information that they would seek a surgeon based on minimally invasive technique. Um, they they base it on the surgeon's experience with um, you know the number of surgeries they've delivered in a minimally invasive technique, and so that starts to get at that recovery. While it doesn't get all the way to enhanced recovery care protocols like we're talking about, hmm. that's kind of ahead of everybody. It, it does get to the fact that uh, those who've been th- more experienced with it, they're thinking about. Actors beyond where's my primary care doctor sending or suggesting I go. And uh, gentlemen, I want to I want to dive into an open discussion. This is completely I wouldn't say it's unrelated to Goldfinch Health, but I just want to have a discussion sure. about healthcare right now. I work for the women's basketball team, as my podcasters and listeners hate me bringing up, but um, it's it, it's interesting to think about for athletes and how this affects them with surgery. Um, athletes, as you know, if you watch any football game, any professional or collegiate football game, there are injuries in every single game. A lot of them end up uh, resulting in uh, surgery. Uh, and for college students, uh, including myself, who was employed by uh, the University of Arizona, um, you know, they don't offer health insurance. Um, uh, John, I'll, I'll pass this one to you. Do you think college uh, is, should, um, you know, think about or, or have the uh, – how do, I, how do I rephrase this? Do you think colleges are responsible for, you know, uh, a, a, an athlete's injury and how um, should they be looking at a uh, treating their, their surgery and, and their recovery as well? I mean, uh, that's, that's an exceptionally good question. I think opens up to larger discussions that uh, on the NCAA in general, uh, you know, they uh, a, um, uh, I mean, you're an Iowa fan, you're like, a Hawkeye fan. You got, you got some. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. About. From things like being able to, uh, utilize your own likeness to, um, to surgery after those, um, you know, those injuries that are incurred in, in their um, you know, sports arena. And I mean, I, I guess I'm just kind of a, um, call me old fashioned, but if, if, if you're responsible for, uh, for an interaction that led to a negative outcome, whether it was an auto accident or a torn ACL in a football game that you were selling tickets for, um, there's a little bit of responsibility that you that you ought to be accountable for. So uh, I don't know what Brand's thoughts are on that, but this is a uh, I think a much larger discussion on um, you know uh, student athletes uh, exposures. Enhance recovery for all. <laughs> That's right. It spans. It's an answer across the age groups and across all surgeries. We say it's you know it applies to uh, oral surgery as much as it applies to open heart surgery and everything in between. So. Um, the same principles definitely apply to sports injuries for, for 19 year olds as they do for a, a 60 year old going through a joint replacement. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a, a, a woman on the, on the team who suffered three ACL tears and on the same knee, you know, and she's working yes. her butt off every single summer to get yeah. back and, you know, produce for the school. Um, and, you know, fortunately her, you know, father happens to be one of the most famous baseball players of all time, Ken Griffey Jr. Um, but, you know, had, you know, she had been someone else, uh, someone else on the team who came from nothing, that would have been very difficult to, yeah. you know, mentally just come back from that. Um, and then, you know, physically as well. Uh, no but I, I want to stay on the sports because I also know someone from the NBA who <laughs> suffered, you know, ho- just horrible knees. I uh, went through a couple surgeries and then became, you know, addicted to uh, yeah. uh, painkillers. Um, do you see your solution, you know, fitting in and working in, uh, in a professional uh, sports program and and what's the current approach to these athletes uh, recovery if you know them yeah so i i i think you know as we um as we begin to build out our program we will be expanding it to to any and all and particularly those are some high profile cases but the 
that's, that's a perfect example of someone who thinks that you have the best around them. Yeah. But if you don't ultimately have the, the latest literature or that someone who is ultimately with that patient advocating for them, who knows where they're going to end up? You know, I, I have a, an example um, a little bit outside the sports realm, but I had an uncle who um, was a Harvard graduate. He was dean of freshman at Georgetown and was an exceptionally successful consultant. And he went in for a hip replacement, which is semi-elective two years ago, December. Uh, same deal. You'd think this guy is, has it all figured out, but much like your friend who the athlete, you're, you're as naive as a five-year-old when you go into surgery and he got a hospital born infection because he did not get an ERAS protocol and he never left the hospital. So I, my cousins now lost their dad and we read his, um, his, his wife read his um, uh, retirement speech that she was going to give at his funeral. These are life altering events. You have an individual like your, your friend who is, has the whole world in front of him and is exceptionally gifted. And because of that, the, the sad and insane irony is that, that's, that his athletic abilities ultimately what led him to his addiction, which is consuming his life. And that's kind of what we're, uh, we're ultimately trying to end. We're, we're, um, we're trying to change. I, I, I do want to mention one thing because we don't, we're not trying to demonize the physicians um, by any means. There are exceptional physicians and they are uh, working tirelessly to, um, to work and deliver care. But in that the way that our society, our healthcare is set up is that if you are a physician going the extra mile, taking the extra meeting, taking the extra call, very few people know about it. There's not a good channel to know about who's doing the extra work and who's exceptional. And if you're not doing a very good job and you are still practicing medicine the way it was in 1985 when you graduated from your residency, no one knows about it. So we're not incentivizing our physicians to progress. We're not disincentivizing them to, uh, to, um, uh, to get moving we really need to kind of take a look at how we're treating our athletes, how we're treating our loved ones and say, there's a better way. And that better way can be through transparency and understanding of the literature. It doesn't have to be so pay opaque. Goldfinch is really trying to set a culture up to make the complicated, frightening situation, potentially frightening situation of surgery, simple, easy to understand and personal. Well, John, uh, thanks for sharing that as well. Um, yeah, I, ju I just wanted to know your takes on those two issues. Uh, I think that's important times. Uh, and I really like that you said, you know, you're not blaming this on these clinicians. You know, again, you know, everyone's acting rationally. Uh, but gentlemen, yeah, we've had a fun time on the podcast. Hey, at least I have. Um, you know, we kind of started with my little cycling story. I don't even know why I brought that up. Um, but uh, we, we talked really about, you know, why this is important, though. Um, whether it was uh, John's story with a juxtaposition of, of someone passing away and someone having a successful surgery, uh, Brand, you know, with your the story with your mother, uh, you know, having cancer her treatment and not having to use any opioids and saying, you know, this can be it. You two aligning, how is this going to be better? Well, we're going to have better transparency in a better way uh, to prepare for your recoveries and and follow up with it after and get you the the right uh, um, plan of action that you need. Uh, and then lastly, we followed up with a little sports talk, uh, maybe a little thing of what to come. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but, you know, gentlemen, this, is, this has been a pleasure being with you all today. Um, you know, we are the Real Leaders Podcast. Uh, so, you know, the last question I have, uh, and Brian, I'm just going to pass this one to you. You can answer this. Um, what is your definition of a real leader? I think, uh, I think our definition of a real leader is, is someone who sees in, in healthcare patients unnecessarily suffering. Um, recoveries that are too long, opioid prescriptions that were unneeded, complications that were um, certainly unjustified. And, uh, and that's exactly what, uh, what we saw. And uh, so kind of closing out the, the definition is seeing that and then being willing to do something about it, uh, make sacrifices, set aside other plans, set aside a, you know, a perfectly good job that was out there and a, a stable income to set that aside and go after it. That's what we're doing. We're going after it. We want to change the way surgery is experienced in the United States. All right, folks. So. Well, everyone, everyone listening out there, you see a problem, go after it and solve it. <laughs> Potentially have a solution. Um, uh, for John Greenwood and Brand Newland, I'm Kevin Edwards telling you all to keep it real. <laughs>